Well, how many of you told somebody this week that you were going to church on Sunday? We get to go home. That's it. We're done. Let's pray. Everybody can go on home because I was, no, I'm just kidding. That's awesome. That's awesome. How many of you told somebody this week that you are the church? I got a hand. Very good. So many times we make the misconception, and, and especially, especially church members, uh, church goers, I should say, we make the mistake of saying the church is, is where we're at. It's the building we're in, it's the pews that we're sitting in, uh, it's the fellowship hall, it's the offices, it's the Sunday school rooms, it's all of those things. But the reality of it is when we meet, wherever we're at, we're the church, right? Right? You walk down the street, you're the church. So I say that for a couple of reasons. First of all, for all of those sitting at home who couldn't brave the weather or watch it online uh, through our live stream, you are still at church this morning. So there you go. Um, the second reason why I bring that up is because I think as the church there are some things that we need to be reminded of at times. So... With no further ado, I would ask that you would turn to Acts chapter 2. The scripture that we're about to read this morning, uh, I can't imagine what must have been going on in heaven for what we're about to read. And, and, and so many times, I guess that can be said of so many things in scripture, uh, of, of, of the angels as, as they're watching down and, and, and just anticipating that these things are, are about to happen as God has, has, has uh, foretold and, and for, uh, ordained all of these various things that are, that are about to take place. And um, we come to this point where it's not only a pivotal time in the life of the disciples, but it's also a pivotal time in the life of the early church. At this point in our timeline, just as a, as a quick uh, bring everybody up to speed sort of thing. Um, Jesus has lived his life. He has been crucified on the cross. He's risen. He's appeared to many in and throughout Jerusalem and the disciples at the Sea of Galilee. He's reinstated Peter after his denial in the courtyard on the night of Jesus' trial. He's ascended into heaven, and he is awaiting his second coming. So that's where we are in the timeline. And so, as we get on, on through to this point, the disciples, being the good followers that they were, have followed Jesus' instructions. After he reinstates Peter at Galilee, he says, go back to Jerusalem because a helper's coming. Go there and wait. So they, they do as they're told. They go back to Jerusalem, and obviously we know what, what takes place. Uh, the Holy Spirit shows up. It comes upon the believers that were present there in Jerusalem. They begin to preach and prophesy in, in various tongues so that all the people around them will be able to hear and understand them. And, and you, we, we know that story. You know, a lot of people are like, well, these guys are drunk. And they're like, no, they're not drunk. They're not drunk. You need to listen to what they're saying. And so it's at this point that Peter stands up and gives what, what we believe to be the first post-ascension sermon, so to speak. Right? This, this is the first time that, that, that a preacher is, is standing up after Jesus' ascension saying, I have something you need to hear. And of course, we know that after Peter preaches who Jesus was and, and that there is a call to repentance from their sins, that they can now be forgiven of their sins and have this life through Jesus. We know that over 3,000 men came to know the Lord that day. And while that in and of itself, we, 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 we could stop preaching right there, while, while that by itself is, is amazing, what, what happened as a result of that laid the foundation for what we would see to be the churches today. So stand with me this morning as we read out of Acts chapter 2, and we're going to start at verse 42 and read through 47. He says, and they devoted themselves 
to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, Lord. God, even though it may be treacherous outside, Lord, we do thank you for the snow, Lord. We thank you for uh, the beautiful seasons that you give us every year. And Lord, we just pray for safety as we drive home. Lord, we pray for those that are on the road uh, traveling. Lord, we pray for those that are about to travel. And Lord, we just uh, ask this morning as we gather here in, in your name, Lord, that you would bless our time. God, that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, that you would challenge us with your word. It's in Jesus' name that we ask these things. Amen. How awesome. How, how awesome must it have been there that day? If, if, if you're one of Jesus' disciples and, and, and you've walked with, with him all these years and suddenly Peter gets up and preaches and... and Thousands of people come to know the Lord. People's lives were changed in the blink of an eye. The impact um, of that change for those people was that they began to share what God was doing. They began to, to spread the gospel, so to speak. News, news quickly ran through Jerusalem and, and about Jesus and, and what he had done for mankind. The church was growing by what we would say by leaps and bounds, right? I know what everybody's thinking. I, I know what you're thinking right now. Man, wouldn't that be awesome if that was what was happening right now? Wouldn't that be great? If, if the church was just growing by leaps and bounds. And I'm not just talking about Northside. I'm not talking about every day that we come in here that, that there's more and more and more people. That would be awesome. But I'm talking about the church, capital C, across the state, across the country, across the world. That every day thousands and thousands and thousands of people came to know the Lord. It would be awesome to see the Lord work that way again, wouldn't it? You know, this story is, is powerful. The story that we just read, uh, it can move us, right? We, we read it, we get excited. And it would be easy for us to read it, to reminisce a little bit, maybe dream just a little bit of how great it would be to see these wonderful things take place again, and then we move on to chapter 3 and we start reading some more. But if we do that, we, we miss something. We miss something actually pretty important. This is not just a story, these, these last few verses in the second chapter. This isn't just some story that was, that was thrown in to the Bible just for funsies, right? There's something here. There's, there is a point. There is a meaning. These verses that we just read, they, they not only tell us what happened to the early church, but they tell us how it happened to the early church. In essence, it's a blueprint. Now, I know um, there's a lot of men in the room this morning, and uh, as one of those men... It's hard for me to read the instructions, right? We buy something, we get something, and we look at it, and we go, I can throw that together. I learned very early on in my marriage with Christina that we were a good team when it came to putting together cabinets or dressers or entertainment centers or various things like that because she would get the instructions out and read to me the instructions. It was kind of a win-win because I didn't have to read the instructions. I still held my man card, in my opinion, 
But she read the instructions very clearly to me that we would put the things together. And we didn't fight, hardly at all. So it worked out, it worked out really well. But as men, sometimes we need to read the instructions, right? We need to look at the blueprints. We need to see what it is that we're being told. And the reality is that these blueprints that were given 2,000 years ago, they still work today. What did that blueprint contain? Well, this morning we're going to very briefly look at the four basic foundational activities of the early church. What were those four things? Well, the first thing they did was this. Learning. Learning. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Some of your Bibles will even say, as we get on down in here, they, they daily met, right? So daily they were doing this. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever devoted yourself to something daily and stuck to it? Yeah. Even if it was for a short period of time, most of us have at least attempted that. I, uh, when I was in high school, I was a senior, and uh, our youth group was taking a ski trip. I felt this story was appropriate given the snow. We were taking a ski trip to Copper Mountain, uh, Breckenridge, and then there's another one right around. I don't remember what it was called, but, but it was like a five-day ski trip. And, and the kids that had went before uh, had, had basically made very clear that you have to uh, be willing to try new things. I'd never skied before. I'd never been on skis. And they're like, you need to be real flexible. Like, your body, you need to be flexible because it's hard. And I'm like, okay, I'm not flexible, right? I'm about to amaze you guys. Are you ready for this? That's as close as I can get to my toes. Ever. All growing up, I cannot touch my toes. I can't get close. But, given the fact that all of my buddies are like, dude, you need, you need to be flexible. I'm telling you, 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 you wipe out on these skis and it's, it's going to hurt. Okay, fine. So, for three months before we went on this ski trip, I devoted myself daily to stretching to touch my toes. Guess what happened? After about a month, I could touch my toes. Then I could reach around and grab the bottoms of my feet. It's like, well, this is awesome. So then I hooked a belt to the wall. You don't know this. Don't look in the basement on the wall. But I hooked a belt, drilled it in, and pulled myself past my toes to about a foot past my feet. I was like, this is awesome. Daily devoted myself to touching and reaching past my toes, which proved to be very good because I wiped out and spent about six hours in the infirmary on the third day. So, um, there's another part to that story. Ask me about it later. Anyway, I, I'm sure he probably does. Anyway. The church placed a high priority on teaching the Word of God. It was a high priority. The apostles had walked with Jesus. They had learned from Jesus. He, he had spent a great deal of time teaching them and showing them the things of the Lord and the things of God. It's only natural for those that were new to the faith to come in, to fall under their teaching, to, to hear what the Lord had to say through them. It makes sense. It was a big deal. The teaching of God's Word was a big deal. So much so that, that as we read the stories, as we go through the book of Acts, we find out that, that, that the numbers continue to grow and, and, and the needs continue to grow and the needs of the church got greater and there's a fight between uh, the widows and, and all these different groups or who's going to do this and who's going to do that. And so at one point, the, 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 the apostles are like, we're not here to do that stuff. We're here to teach this. And so they appoint and they, they, they create the the first ever deacon body, so to speak, and, and, and they start laying out these foundations of how the church is supposed to function because their priority was this. Not too many churches these days focus that much on the Bible. These people were interested in the doctrine. They were interested in what... What is it that we are supposed to believe? What are the foundational truths that we're supposed to learn and to understand and to grow in? They, they, they wanted to know what the disciples knew. 
They wanted to know what the people who walked with Jesus knew. They wanted it. The Bible says they met together daily. Can you imagine what the church would be like if we met together daily? Let me not let you imagine that. Dallas is laughing because he knows where I'm going with this. If we met together daily, the church wouldn't exist because we would be fighting and arguing and bickering nonstop. As it is today, the church as it is today. Because there's too many personalities, there's too many preferences. But they met daily. They came together every single day to do a number of things, and we're going to talk about those. It's funny that as we look at this and as we talk about these things and we bring up just the reality of, of the different personalities within the local bodies of believers and, and how arguments can, can ensue and... and disagreements can take place, and it's, it's a reality everywhere you go. It's funny that the very next thing that we get in our blueprint deals directly with that issue. The second thing we look at is fellowship. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. I don't know if any of you guys are aware of this or not, but... Uh, Roy, Roy may be, but uh, the word used here for fellowship is a very hard translated word. It, it, it's not one that just easily flows from the original transcripts. And, and so the, 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 the word that we use, or the word that came from the Greek, is koinonia. Koinonia. And, and the reality is we have no English equivalent. There, there's, no, there's no crossover to, to get us there. Uh, basically, this word means an intimate sharing of one's self with another. An intimate sharing of one's self with another. And so another way that, 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 that this is translated is the word contribution. Right? And, and some of you guys are seeing where, where this is heading to. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says this. He says, what communion has light with darkness? And this word that he uses is koinonia. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians about giving of the money to the saints, for the poor saints in Jerusalem, he, he states that they've received the gift, they'll glorify God for the fact that they've received the gospel of Christ and for their liberal distribution unto them. Guess what the word that he used there for distribution is? Koinonia. When he wrote to uh, the church of Philemon, he says, he thanked God and we heard of his love and the faith which he had toward Jesus and all of the saints. And that the communication of his faith might become effectual? Guess what the word that he uses there? Koinonia. When we read verse 42, when we go through this understanding of what the early church experienced, we're, we are to understand that these believers, when they met together, and they had this, what we call, fellowship, it was this idea of koinonia. Have you caught on yet? Have you figured out yet where, where, where this is going? It, it makes sense, right? It makes sense because when we eat over here, right, this is fellowship for us. We say fellowship, that's the fellowship hall. We go over and we eat. We, we get this idea of we all kind of bring something in together. It's a potluck, right? The USDA doesn't like that, but we do it anyway. We all come together, we eat. problem. The problem is, is that too many churches look at fellowship as just as fellowship, and they leave out this quinoinia idea, this, this distribution, this intimate giving of oneself to one another. Too many churches think of fellowship as an event. And because it's an event, we have to have entertainment. Right? That's never what fellowship was about. Fellowship has and, and, and was and always has been about this idea of coming together as a body of believers, giving of oneself, distributing of oneself to take care of the needs of the entire body. It, 
in essence, we kind of do that with the dinners. If you think of it in, in, in the most basic fashion, the food that we bring, we're doing that. But are we doing it on, on the level that it needs to be done on? We're Baptists. We like to eat. I'm not complaining. But there's a deeper meaning of fellowship here. As we're going to find out here in just a second, it's, it's, it's about more than just the food. The third thing that we understand as we read through this is this idea of communion. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and it and to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread. The word communion, which is what what we we oftentimes refer to our Lord's Supper as communion, and other denominations do that as well. This this word actually means the sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings, especially when the exchange is on a mental or a spiritual level. The early church met together to break bread. Not only to eat together, but to be one together. And not only be one together, but to be one in Christ together. That's what we're doing when we do the Lord's Supper. Paul writes in Corinthians, he says, the cup of blessing which we bless, it is not the communion Or is it not the communion of the blood of Christ, the bread which we break? Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? You guys want to know a secret? The word that he uses here for uh, communion? Anybody want to guess what it is? Quinonia. It's this communion that we have. It's this demonstration of oneness that we all share in Christ. When we come together together, when we have our, our time of the Lord's Supper, which we had just a couple weeks ago, it's a time for us to, yes, we, we, we ask forgiveness for our sins, we, 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 we are honest with God, we, we seek for that, that fresh beginning, that new start, that let's just start everything over, Lord, and forgiving my sins and, and, and grow back close to Him. And, but it's also that we are all doing it as one body together. We're eating of the same bread. We're eating and drinking of the same juice if you, want to get, if you want to get super, super technical, the, 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 the grape juice comes from one jug, right? It's this idea of we're sharing it from one jug. It's the idea that we're sharing it from one, one set of food that has been blessed, the, the holy sacraments. And as we partake of those, each and every one of us, we spiritually unite as a body of believers. What a beautiful demonstration of this idea of oneness. Our, uh, our denomination isn't necessarily this way, but there are some denominations that practice closed communions, which basically, which basically means that they, uh, they don't allow anyone who's not part of their local congregation or, or their extended uh, body of believers in their particular denomination. <laughs> We, uh, we do an open communion, right? We, we have this belief that we are the body of Christ. In verse 46, he says that they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking of bread from house to house, they did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. How awesome. So we have learning, we have fellowship, we have communion. And the last thing that they did, the last piece of this blueprint is prayer. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Although we have to to point this out, although this is the fourth function that's listed in the blueprint, it by no means takes fourth place. It's not categorically listed, right? If, if we look at it, if we study, if we, if we uh, really look at the Bible, we realize that, that, that prayer in this, in this context is just a stop of priority, if not 
maybe a little bit more even than studying God's word and listening to what the apostles and teachers had to say. And unfortunately, this idea of prayer is another one of those pieces of the blueprint that sadly is missing in so many churches these days. A lot of times uh, we, see, we see a lot of emphasis on the events. We see a lot of emphasis on service. We see a lot of emphasis uh, on, on, on uh, programs that, that center around teaching. And it's not that those are bad. I'm not saying that at all. But we fail. We fail. A lot of churches fail when it comes to spending time in prayer. What, what would happen to the church if, if there was a, a, a massive call to prayer across the country, across the world, and, and people took it seriously? We would see some pretty amazing things. You know, it was a couple years ago, uh, maybe not quite that long ago, uh, when there was the, the, um, the hurricane that was about to hit Florida, and, and that's all they talked about for a week, and that Saturday night, you know, it was supposed to get close, and then Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, it was supposed to hit, and, and Roy and I had a long discussion on this a couple of days later, but, you know, this thing, by all accounts, was supposed to just destroy half of Florida, and they just didn't see it. It showed up, it caused a little bit of damage, and it was a little bit of a problem, but it wasn't anything what all these meteorologists are standing around shaking their heads going, what happened? Well, I believe, and I know many of you believe, that it was prayer. And, and I think it I think it was as, and I use this word very cautiously, as shallow as the fact that it happened on a Saturday night and people were talking about it on a Sunday morning at church and they said, let's pray about this. I truly believe that. So what would happen, what would happen if that type of fervent prayer took place across the nation and across the world daily. Imagine what the world would look like. Prayer is, is referred to as the binding of the strong man of the house, right? This idea of Satan. Our battle that, 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 that we take part in, it's, it's a spiritual battle, right? Our weapons are not, are not carnal weapons, but they're pretty mighty. They're pretty mighty because through God, they pull down the strongholds. Paul closes this section as he's talking about this in Ephesians. And he's talking about spiritual warfare. He's talking about equipping the saints for battle. He says this, Praying with all prayer and supplications in the Spirit, let your requests be made known to God. Prayer, it's, it's not only the perfect weapon in this war, but it's, it's also part of the essential foundations of who we are as the church. We just recently had a 12-hour day of prayer here at Northside. And while we had, we, we had a good turnout, we did. I, I felt like it was, it was a good event. I felt like people, people showed up and supported it. Maybe 15% of the church Maybe 20% of the church showed up. Maybe. If, if, if you look at the numbers and you say, you know, hey, we run X amount on Sunday morning-ish, about 15%, maybe 10% showed up for prayer. I know we could say, well, that's asking a lot. It's 12 hours of prayer. No. <laughs> it, was, it was come by the church and pray. We set up 30-minute increments. If you just wanted to come by and pray for a few minutes, you could. I, somebody said, well, they were signed up on the time that I wanted to come. So? <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not like the, uh, the phones used to be, and it was just you can only have one person on the line at a time. We've, God has three-way calling now, right? He can, he can hear more than one person. It's our goal, and Josh and I have talked about this, Mary Jean, we've talked about this. We would like to do uh, 12 hours of prayer a couple of times a year. Right now, we only do it in January. I'd like to see another one later on in the year. But I would like to see the church 
grab onto it. What would be amazing is, 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 to, is to encourage not only that we have a lot of participation, but that people would write down some of the things they prayed for and then go back and look at those a few months later. And guess what? You would probably be pretty amazed at what you found out. This morning I'm going to ask that Joshua to come up and get ready for our time of invitation. You know, when it comes to the foundations of of the early church, it's not all that different than where we are right now. Our focus is and should always be on, on learning God's Word, whether it be on a Sunday morning from the pulpit, whether it be on a Wednesday night in the fellowship hall or out throughout the building or on a Sunday night here or at somebody's home, or whether it be in your own home during a quiet time or a devotion. Studying and learning, growing closer to the Lord. I can't overemphasize enough the idea of fellowship. And there are so many people that believe they can be part of the church without ever being a part of the church. It wasn't meant to be that way. The breaking of bread, the giving of oneself. And finally, prayer. I would ask that you would stand this morning as, as we have our time of invitation. If the Lord has, has brought you here today and there's something you need to, to pray about, if there's some time that you need to spend with Him, I would encourage you to come down and do that this morning. Maybe there's some things that you're struggling with and, and you'd like someone to pray with you. I, I would love to pray with you. I know there are other people here that would love to pray with you as well. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this morning, Lord, for getting us here safely, Lord. God, I do pray that you would remind us, Lord, of what our foundations truly are. God, what the focus of the church truly should be. God, that we at Northside, Lord, would, would, would take a long look at, at who we are and the things that we're doing, Lord. And God, there are so many wonderful things that we do here, Lord, that, that fall directly in line with these foundations, Lord. But God, if there are things that we're doing, Lord, whether it be as a, as a corporate church, Lord, or whether it's something we're doing personally that falls out of line, God, with, with, with the foundations, Lord, with what it is that you've called us to be as the church, God, I pray that you would convict us of that. God, that you would bring us a point where we would see and to understand and to know that there's changes that need to be made. God, whatever the case may be, Lord, I pray that you'll speak to our hearts this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.